uh, this next panel is uh, uh, going to focus a little more on the investment picture, both from a macro microeconomic point of view. Uh, uh, Suganda uh, Tuladar uh, is uh, with uh, NERA Economic Consulting. He's the Associate Director in Energy Environment and Communications, covers a lot of territory. We're delighted he's here today. Um, uh, he's, he's been working in various areas for uh, quite a bit of time, and, uh, and uh, I think this probably is his first uh, appearance at a WIRES meeting, and, and uh, we're, we're delighted. He's uh, uh, got a, a Master of Science in, in uh, Operations Research Industrial Engineering and a PhD in Economics from UT. Uh, University of Texas, and um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Suganda, for being here. Um, and Chrissy Tezak, uh, y y you have uh, probably uh, seen her at other WIRES events, but uh, she has been uh, a very well-known uh, analyst uh, in, uh, in the Washington area for quite a while. She's managing director at Cl Clearview uh, Energy Partners. Um, and uh, it covers electricity markets, uh, interstate pipelines, energy infrastructure, and environmental policy. And um, uh, she comes, uh, came to Clearview from, uh, from Robert Baird uh, in the Washington Research Group. Um, she is, uh, uh, has been uh, honored by the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment, affectionately known as WESI, and she has a uh, a degree in uh, Russian from Boston College, which these days you never know could come in quite handy. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, thank you, Christy, for being here as well. Uh, our our next panelist uh, is uh, Jim Lucier. Uh, Jim uh, uh, is uh, very well known to uh, to people in uh, in the uh, uh, FERC and uh, energy analytics space. Uh, he's managing director of Capita Alpha. Uh, it used to be Capita Alpha Partners, but I think it's just Capital Alpha now. Um, and he leads the energy environment and, and tax practices. Uh, uh, Jim tells me his, his first love is really tax, uh, and uh, he's kind of migrating back in that area, but we're happy we could, uh, uh, could lasso him for, for this appearance. Um, he was Senior Vice President of Prudential uh, Equity Group and has been doing, uh, uh, sharing his views with, with WIRES and other energy uh, uh, associations for quite a while. And uh, Jim is a, a, great, uh, a great friend. Uh, Todd Ryan uh, comes to us from Smart Wires, where he is Director of Regulatory Affairs. Uh, Smart Wires is out in the Bay Area, but uh, they're an uh, increasingly prominent, very interesting company, uh, also a member of Wires. Um, uh, Todd previously worked at Beacon uh, Power, um, did a lot of work in a, a flywheel-based energy storage uh, area and uh, other technologies. Uh, he, too, has a Ph.D. and um, is a is a, 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 a guy with a, a fresh perspective on a lot of the issues we've talked about today. So um, we're going to start with the macro and, and maybe move to the specific technology. So uh, Sugandar, if, if you would. Thanks, Jim, for having me. Uh, this is my first time, as Jim said, uh, participating in WIRES. and. To be honest, I didn't even know what wires was before Jim called me last week, and I had to step up because a friend of mine basically pushed me into the fire here. So, so, so uh, today my talk is going to be a little bit, slightly, not slightly, quite a great deal of difference than what we've heard in the previous panels, and I'm going to take a little bit of a macro approach of looking at infrastructure investment in general and then dive into a little bit about uh, what does this mean in terms of tra transmission investment to the broad economy at large, because oftentimes the question comes uh, about is the investment infrastructure in the best interest uh, of the consumers, you know, and does it serve as a public interest in terms of public interest determination? Is it good to invest 
and is it serving the community at large? Uh, we've certainly heard uh, early this morning about trying to look at an infrastructure or even a transmission project uh, in terms of just from a very micro perspective of looking at the benefit and looking at the cost and then looking at what is the net benefit or net cost and then rationalizing the project on that aspect. But I'm going to take a little bit of more uh, macro approach in a sense that any infrastructure project does not sit in an island. It is connected to the broad economy at large. You know, what the infrastructure, what the transmission infrastructure does would have impact on the electricity rates and then it's going to have impact on the, uh, let's say, uh, industrial sector, how they use their energy, what might happen to their cost of production, what does it mean in terms of their export values or supplying it to the domestic, and then what does it mean to the consumers at large? Do they get let off? Do they get more wages and their income increases? Do they have more purchasing power to sort of spend on goods and services? So that's the broad theme I'm going to talk about, and I would sort of conclude uh, sort of just trying to uh, bring all these together, trying to figure out, trying to sort of put forward what are the necessary ingredients of a sort of an economic tool or a model that might be able to capture these uncertainty that surrounds any infrastructure investment, be it some sort of macroeconomic driver or technology uncertainty or other forms of uncertainty. So I'll try to put forward a framework that might be useful, and that's a framework I've been sort of developing over many, many years. And let me start off by uh, my first slide here. Yeah. So I think I'm going to start off by trying to sort of put all this in context with uh, some of the projects that I've done uh, that might be sort of infrastructure in uh, nature, but not necessarily a, a transmission project. So uh, we heard uh, a question from there uh, for Pat on Alaska. So my first example is basically looking at an infrastructure project uh, the, in, in Alaska. This is basically the LNG, Alaska LNG project. Essentially, as uh, uh, the gentleman there uh, commented, that basically you have pockets of uh, markets in Alaska, and uh, the pockets of sort of cities are not well connected. As a result, there is obviously uh, the gas uh, supply is much more constrained. And if you look at the gas price in Alaska relative to the lower 48, obviously, and the consumers are paying much higher price. At the same time, there's a potential of this Alaska natural gas resource on the north slope, right, that might have tremendous value if that was to be exported, given that there's a differential between, you know, when I started this project way back when, a couple of years back, there was a differential between uh, what the natural gas was being sold in, in the uh, East Asian market versus what it might cost uh, in terms of trying to produce in the local market. So basically, the, the, this, this particular Alaska project is, it, it was like, you know, you got to build this 800 mile long uh, pipeline all the way from North Slope uh, down to the LNG liquefaction plant on the south side. Um, uh, at the same time, there was a declining sort of domestic supply from the Cook Inlet uh, into the uh, domestic market. And then um, we need to build this liquefaction plant, which is, again, uh, an infrastructure heavy. So there is a combination of building the liquefaction plant, which is quite infrastructure, uh, quite heavy investment, coupled with 800 miles long of uh, pipeline uh, in order to then be able to supply that uh, LNG to the you know, market abroad, wherever that might be taking place. So, so that's the setting. And... This, to me, is like no different than trying to construct a transmission infrastructure anywhere here where either we bring uh, wind energy from North Dakota all the way down to the, you know, uh, wherever there's a demand pocket by sort of building in a long uh, transmission project. It's a similar concept, but then the question really becomes, is this project in the best interest of the community? Is it in the best interest of the people living in Alaska? Would they be able to enjoy lower natural gas prices? Would that, would that natural gas support the domestic industry? And then would the export value of that natural gas provide additional sort of uh, export value to the U.S. as a whole? And then would that improve our terms of trade 
uh, and then at the end of the day, is that beneficial? So that's sort of the scene, and obviously, uh, after doing this analytical work, what we found that is basically, obviously, you know, after we build this pipe, there's a cost associated with building the pipe, but at the same time, there are economic benefit that comes as a result of increasing natural gas. Uh, there's, uh, there's more, more sort of, it relieves the pressure in the domestic natural gas market, so there's a lower price that the domestic consumers, Alaskans, they enjoy than in the current case where there are uh, supply constraint. At the same time, since there's lower natural gas, you get an sort of impetus in terms of natural gas using industry and there's an industrial growth uh, that essentially means that you know, um, you know, wages are, goes up, people are getting more income and then it improves the quality or the purchasing power of the consumers. At the end of the day, there's an improvement in the consumer well-being. So that is sort of how we capture, you know, is it worth investing in this infrastructure and our analytical sort of our analysis shows that it was in, in, in it, it certainly had the economic benefit not only to the consumers uh, on the ground but at all, as also it, it justified the investment of this magnitude so that's one example i think along the same vein we also did just a couple of years back looking at uh, another second example but a very similar sort of energy related work was we looked at what would be the potential economic benefit to the U.S. if U.S. was to lift, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the lift the ban on crude oil export. Basically there, in that analysis, again, we showed that, you know, we need to, then our analysis shows where the crude is going to be produced, you know, how much uh, refinery expansion is possible, and w where the demand might be, and what would be the implication on the global crude oil market. Uh, as well as what are the potential benefits. So again, that's an infrastructure sort of driven project that we are able to look at, looking at various economic drivers of, you know, what if there is a change in market condition in, uh, in Asia, or if there was a strategic behavior from OPEC on their price response, what would that ultimately mean to the benefit, and can we rationalize the infrastructure investment that we are potentially sort of envisioning? So. I, I think one needs to be aware that it is when we think about infrastructure, transmission infrastructure, or any old infrastructure, we need to think much bigger than the sector itself because it has essentially relationship with other aspect of the economy. So the second example is just looking at, a, 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 again, a, a small project that I did where looking at what is the potential of, you know, um, building a hydro plant investment in an East European country. Again, this country depends a lot on the natural gas import, obviously, from Russia, with a lot of uncertainty associated with it. They wanted to sort of build in hydro plants so that uh, they can minimize the risk, and then basically just to e ease it justified uh, in from, from, from trying to sort of be dependent on natural gas uh, and sort of move away and try to produce their own domestic uh, domestic sort of produce uh, electricity and obviously again same same line of thought where they basically uh, with this uh, infrastructure investment which is a hydro plant which has a lifetime of uh, we were sort of about 40 years that essentially sort of increase the supply of uh, uh, electricity in the domestic market reducing the electricity price and then displacing imports of natural gas. So there are all these benefits. At the same time, there's a cost of investment where it was financed by an international uh, bank, and these guys have to pay it over a certain period of time. Even with those sort of uh, payments that these guys had to pay, uh, I, I think uh, it's it certainly justified. Now, I think moving on, I, I, I think moving on, looking at just on the, uh, the different types of uh, uncertainty that might matter and how it might impact the generation. So, so this is sort of looking at, I did a couple of just runs where basically I've sort of created a baseline, uh, oops, sorry. So basically we have the baseline generation, obviously we've got coal, natural gas, uh, nuclear CCS, that's CC, CC with CCS, uh, wind, solar, bio, and other generation, and 
I did a couple of sensitivity just to look at, just to give you a viewpoint that you know, market conditions does matter and the regulatory policy does matter and this provides you know, a wide range of you know, mix of generation which obviously is going to have an impact on how you build your transmission and where the demand pockets and the supply pockets emerges as a result of these types of uncertainty. The first line is obviously the baseline. The second one is a very aggressive RPS. Uh, the third is basically I just simulated a very uh, Trumpian economic growth, about 3.5%. Uh, then the fourth scenario is basically a deep decarbonization scenario, you know, consistent with like a Paris Accord type of scenario, and then a very mild $25 tax. So on the right side is the long run sort of generation mix, and on the left side is the short run generation mix. Obviously, not much happening on the short run because the policy uncertainty is not that great uh, in terms of trying to change your generation mix, but certainly it does have impact on the long run as to, as to how the market evolves or even the technology or the regulatory uh, uncertainty evolves. So I, I think one thing, uh, one, one, one aspect is that when we think about transmission sort of investment, we certainly need to think about what is happening or transpiring in the long run, either in the form of regulatory policies or in the form of market conditions that might emerge. So I think it is sort of one needs to be have some, some, some viewpoint of where things are going to evolve in the long run. So this is just a very sort of high level overview of how the market uh, sort of uncertainty might evolve and then uh, impact the total generation mix and then ultimately sort of give you an indication of how the infrastructure might, uh, transmission infrastructure might be developed over time. Obviously, I could have shown the, uh, you know, like somebody did in the previous uh, panel, where it shows uh, how the prices emerge over a period and then layer that with the transmission congestion. Then I, I, I can certainly show where the congestions are sort of emerging under these different policies. So that certainly gives you a much nice pictorial viewpoint in a heat map sense. So I looked at basically you know, uh, between the baseline and in the high growth scenario case. Basically, I, I sort of counted how many transmission lines were, uh, lines were constrained in the baseline versus the high growth scenario, and it sort of doubled. And it, 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 it's not surprising that uh, as your growth picks up, your electricity demand picks up, and your generation picks up, obviously the, the connecting pipes gets constrained, and there's you know, rents to be had at some point. Somebody's can, going to build an infrastructure investment going forward. Now. So tying that, all these sort of nuances of what one needs to sort of take into consideration when you are trying to evaluate an infrastructure project. So, so this is a sort of a cartoon of uh, just a, a, a different blocks or different pieces of sort of a model that one can put forward, right? So, so on the left side, uh, uh, if I can, so. Anyway, so on the left side, you see these various blocks of sort of economic actors. One, um, obviously, we need to have uh, representation of region at sufficient granularity, right? So uh, in the model that we have, on the right-hand bottom side, we have about 63 regions in our model. So we are able to capture exactly, you know, at, at a good fine detail level as to how the demand might emerge and what sort of generation pattern might emerge based on the resources that are available in those regions. So that, that's certainly a, 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 a requirement in order to look at a transmission sort of infrastructure investment to have some sufficient uh, regional representation. Obviously, having a detailed electricity model is a must, right, in order to uh, sort of uh, do any kind of uh, sensible sort of analysis of the electricity sector. So basically, uh, buried underneath our electricity sector, we have a very detailed dispatch model of not only the U.S. regions, but as well as uh, connecting Canadian regions so that we are able to look at uh, cross-border issues uh, as well, as well as sort of bringing all these new technologies into the modeling framework. So that is another sort of a, a prerequisite when we think about trying to look at how do you look at the problem, you know, what are the parameters of the modeling framework that we need. Secondly, given that the transmission infrastructure is a long-run investment, right, 
You just can't look at one static period and do your analysis. You need to have a dynamic sort of model going forward. And obviously, that dynamic also is required if you are trying to capture the uncertainty surrounding regulatory policy or market condition that might emerge in the future. So obviously, so anticipation is required. Certainly, there are requirements of capital markets and labor markets in the model because, as I said, infrastructure investment does not reside in an island. It is connected with all parts of the economy. So we need to bring that into the, into the framework. So just concluding here, obviously, you know, we need to have a broad range of modeling instruments if you want to capture the market condition, different market conditions, or technology that might emerge in the long run. So, so in general, at the end of the day, the modeling uh, work, the model framework that we have developed is in an economic parlance, it's called an equilibrium, general equilibrium model that sort of gives these types of flavors such that at the end of the day, we are able to sort of evaluate and judge the inf uh, investment from a pure economic sense. With that, uh, let me conclude, and uh, I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jim, and uh, I appreciate being back to, to be with all of you today. Um, I only brought one slide, and it got all kinds of super squishy on the screen, so um, Anne and, and Jim were kind enough to make um, some copies for you, which are actually on the table, which will probably be a little bit easier to see. Um, transmission is a pretty good business. Uh, when you talk to investors, uh, they have different styles. As many of you uh, may know, you have the, um, the groups called widows and orphans. They like dividend paying stocks, which utilities and transmission companies tend to be. You have folks who prefer higher growth, higher risk um, investments like technology companies or people who invest in Amazon, which hasn't even made a profit yet, um, but has a f dizzying valuation. Mm -hmm. And so utilities are, have a very specific um, investor base um, in Wall Street. And uh, part of that is because of their stability, their um, income potential, income being the fact that they pay dividends, the return on your investment is not limited to a hopefully constantly improving stock price. And so what you have is a business that has been around for a long time. It requires a whole lot of capital to be raised up front, and then that capital is um, recovered by the investing entity, in this case the utility, over time, over a long time, usually 40 years. Um, so this is the system that we all rely on today. The basis of it was actually built. There was a lot of capital raised up front with the promise that all that money would come back with a reasonable return over the next four decades or more. So what you have is you have a system that in many ways isn't fully paid for, that we're constantly asking more of, and that everyone wants to in some way avoid. So it's a difficult environment to do things revolution uh, that are revolutionary or to change very quickly because that regulatory compact, that commitment between the company that went out to investors and raised money and told them they'd be able to pay it back, and the way they have deployed those assets um, is something that cannot be taken lightly. It can't merely be thrown out the window because we'd really rather have an iPhone. And it is uh, one of the limitations that not only the companies operating in the space face, but also the policymakers and um, the regulators that are confronted with trying to create an environment that allows them to grow and to deliver the services um, that all of us as consumers want. And so, um, you know, when we look at uh, FERC jurisdictional transmission returns, the way FERC sets rates is a not very complicated uh, math, you know, uh, math equation, but since I'm a Russian major, I get to sort of you know, just walk, talk past that. And for purposes of a post-lunch conversation, I'm definitely going to do that. But what you see is you see a basic target for returns on equity that range as low as about 7% to, depending on the year, about as high as just over 14%. And that's what the norm was when interest rates were higher, when capital market conditions were different. Since 2008, 
that has really started to compress, and it really started to compress dramatically after 2014. And so now, utility opportunity for returns on equity is really now limited to a band, which I tried to show here today, of about 7% still on the bottom, and about 12%, if it's been a good month, on top. So the return potential has come in about 200 basis points, which is not inconsistent with the fact that we are in a, a period of structurally low interest rates. And since equity rates tend to follow debt and utility uh, returns tend to be 300 basis points or better over debt, that bringing in at the top end of the range uh, in the wake of a change in the FERC methodology and soft capital market conditions have sort of bounded the opportunity set um, for utilities. But it's still a pretty good business. The question then is, is if the returns are in a vacuum, pretty okay, then are they really correct? And the reason I bring up this question is the fact that there's a lot of politics when it comes to the uh, utility sector, in case you haven't noticed. Um, notwithstanding the fact it's not a central part of a pending energy bill, that doesn't mean it's not important. And it doesn't mean it's not political. Um, Siting, we've talked about today, is difficult. Um, getting, uh, getting your returns back over, over the entirety of your investment window is a challenge. And why is that? Because consumer tastes are changing. What you have is you have customers who are saying, but maybe I want solar on my house. Or maybe we should have a microgrid for our housing development because interest in microgrids is certainly not limited to rural Alaska or places that are isolated. Okay, You have people who are interested in something else other than what's out there. There's batteries, we have electric cars, we've got all this cool stuff and we've got this boring electric grid. And that is one of the real things that utilities have to deal with. It is a for real problem because there is no value assigned to the electric utility grid by most customers. And maybe it's only just my friends who think it's easy that you just turn the switch and the lights come on. And they don't want to pay anything for it, really. The power sector has done a great job delivering a service. In fact, it's so good, it's assumed to be there all the time. When we look at um, the power sector today, we have a surplus of generation. We have a dizzying surplus of generation. In fact, if this were a generation conference, everybody would be complaining that prices are too low. And what that has done is that has basically driven retail electric utility prices to be pretty flat if not to go down. And that's been afforded to us by the decline in natural gas prices that have really sort of caused a lot of the volatility and a lot of the price spikes that we used to see in our power bills driven by natural gas prices to be smoothed out. And we've all gotten used to it and we all like it. So it's difficult to suggest that this wonderful system that we turn the switch and the lights come on and we have, the last time we had a big blackout was 2003. It's hard to buy into this argument that the grid's broken. Could it be better? Well, sure, everything could be better. My computer could be better. My phone could be better. Everything could be better. But that doesn't mean it's broken. And it's a challenge, I think, sometimes to make the case that there's this crying you know, need for $80 billion of investment. And everybody's like, what? It works. It's fine. And that's part of the challenge of doing a good job. Um, to Laura's point, you know, um, earlier, why has investment been so limited? Part of it was the demand growth slowdown that Judy mentioned. Um, we have uncertain regulatory and power generation preferences. Uh, people who are out there selling solar for rooftops like to cast the utility as a big bad guy who's being mean to you and that you should get this cool thing on your roof because somebody else is going to pay you money to do it and you get to do this to the utility. Well, what did the utility ever do to you other than keep your lights on? I, I don't know. Um, when rates are already modest, they have one direction to go. It's up. Usually when you talk about bringing market forces into an environment, you talk about, I'm going to do it for you better and I'm going to do it for you cheaper. Now the proposition is, I'm going to do it for you better and it's going to cost you more. OK, not as compelling. And it's a real impediment for politicians, because when we thought we were going to restructure the utility business, and wasn't that going to be great, the whole idea was prices were too high. There was a better, more efficient way to do this. 
Now, in the power industry, we have more supply, we have softened demand growth, we get more GDP, GDP out of every unit of energy than we ever have, and now people are saying, but I want to be paid for value. I want to be paid for my emissions-free characteristics. I want to be paid for being solar. I want to be paid for being baseload reliability, never mind my emissions. I want to be paid because I'm a natural gas plant because I'm flexible. Everybody wants to be paid and the customer is not interested in writing any checks because they like low power prices. And we have a new administration that loves low power prices. This is a tough environment to raise money in. It is a challenge to sell an intangible. It is difficult to say that we're all going to be great because we're going to have this great grid. Okay. Not everybody thinks lattice towers are beautiful. Although, if you've been on Facebook, you might see some really cool pictures of what they're doing in parts of uh, Northern Europe. They've got them like sculptures. It's really actually kind of cool. But they're far away, preferably well out of your neighborhood, in somebody else's neighborhood. Solar panels are blue. Who doesn't like blue? My dad likes blue no matter what color it is. They're local. They're right there. You can see them. If your power bill goes up, you can point at it and say, that's what happened to it. It's right there. It's not in Colorado. It's not in Montana when you're sitting in Chicago. It's right there. That is a tough sell when you're trying to convince somebody that their rate needs to change because of an improvement they can't get their hands around. Investors really don't care who pays for transmission. To them, all the money's green. They don't care if Illinois pays for part of it and West Virginia pays for another. They just want to know, if this company builds this project, will they recover the money that, they've, that there's been a commitment to deliver? That's all they want to know. I would love to be able to call up my mortgage company and say, you know, I know we had a deal and I know I promised to pay you 4%, but you know, your cost of capital went down, so I'd like to just pay you two. You're good with that, right? That's part of the challenge with renegotiating rates. It's logical to say, well, the utility's cost of capital have, has gone down. I'd suggest, but that's, utility, that's a utility's existing infrastructure underpinned by existing commitments to the capital markets that still need to be paid. That's why we have tensions over rate of return. That's why no matter how bad the capital markets get and how low the cost of capital goes, that's why when you look at settlements, which are all these little green dots for rate cases and complaints, they're above the median projection of FERC's model, which is the, bit, the blue line that sort of hops through the middle of the gray area, okay? That's the median projected return based on FERC's discounted cash flow. But when you look at what customers and utilities negotiate when they have to sit down and work out a settlement, it's above that because of all these intangibles and because of the uncertainty that goes on. Because it works if both sides feel they have gotten a good deal. It takes two to tango as my great uncle used to say. Well, actually, he used to say it takes one to tango because he used to negotiate with Russians and that's the way they like to do it. There's other competition for capital and there's other competition within the electric utility for capital. We've got a lot of generation. I'm going to set that aside for now. That's a whole separate psychosis and it involves cocktails. Um, lots of cocktails. But the other um, entity competing within the utility for this type of capital is the distribution infrastructure. And the distribution infrastructure has an advantage similar to those blue pretty solar panels that you can actually see on your roof or your neighbors. There's clear jurisdiction. The local regulator, the state regulator is going to settle that rate case. You don't have to argue with different states and a much bigger stakeholder group. You have a much smaller group of cats to herd. Again, it's tangible. Most outages on the electric system occur in the distribution system. They used to occur in my neighborhood all the time. And then Dominion finally put something in our mailbox that said on Wednesday we're unplugging your power because we're finally fixing that above ground substation that goes out every time it rains. Awesome. We haven't had an outage since. And that is, again, tangible. It's close to the customer. It's something they can see. When people talk about reliability, resiliency, that's something close to home, and it's something that they can get their heads around. 
So if you're going to ask them to pay more, you know, it's a lot easier for me to say, well, my rates go up a little bit in Virginia, then I'm cool with that because Dominion finally fixed that thing that used to go out all the time. You got to make a trade. There's got to be value in the transaction. And then the last thing I'll leave you with, because I, when Jim said he was going to talk about fashion, I thought I'll, I'd set him up for the handoff. What we've been seeing at Clearview is um, fragmentation, is the theme we are calling it. It's this reversion away from globalization. It's Brexit. It's nationalists in Europe. It's the election of a nationalist-oriented uh, new president who feels very strongly to put um, our country first. And so we're seeing neighborhoods put themselves first. We're seeing municipalities put themselves first. It is difficult to be a fabulous, excellent, world-class, world-beating, regional and global technology when everybody's interested in buying their groceries locally. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jim. Well, thank you, Christy. That's uh, scintillating as always. I'd like to say thank you to Jim Hecker, too, because Jim Hecker runs the classiest conference in town. I think this is the single best conference venue in D.C. I like to keep it as a carefully kept secret for my own meetings. You get the wonderful view of the Capitol. And of course, coming into the elevator and seeing the sign that advertised the new top of the hill menu for cigars and whiskey, I thought, I have hit the jackpot today. So I look forward to the, uh, I look forward to the libations uh, and reception after the event. Um, Jim also touched on something that front runs my own talk a little bit when he mentioned my background as a tax analyst. Uh, I was actually the tax policy guy at Prudential Securities until about the year 2000, and then there wasn't much tax going on, but there was a California power crisis, and they said, well, Mr. Lucier, you can start doing some of this electric power stuff, or you can find another job. I said, I'll take electric power for 2,000, please. <laughs> and that's basically what's happened to me for the past 17 years. I spoke to a WIRES meeting with Christie and a number of other luminaries uh, back in February, and I expressed the pious hope that maybe taxes would be back in fashion and I'd be taxing up a storm. But sadly, sadly, no. There's not much tax stuff going on. Maybe, um, you know, maybe we'll get a tax bill out before the 4th of July, but I tend to doubt it now. So the electricity world has come back. But you know, electricity is interesting because the story of infrastructure, not to mention the industry itself, now goes back well more than a century. And you've got to look at great historical events and uh, trends that have shaped policy. Uh, I will express my skepticism about the high-tech bionic supergrid of the future. But the reality is that we've had shocks over these past 100 years that impact fixed investments over and over and over again, whether it is, in fact, that California power crisis in 2000 uh, uh, and 2001, or whether it's the financial crisis in 2008, which ushered in our low interest rate environment, or um, any number of other things I'll mention in the context of my talk. I'm going to focus mostly on policy from a policy maker's perspective because I think we have a lot of people from the Hill as well as industry in the room. And I also knew that um, Christie was going to take us more strictly investor uh, view of things. So I want to talk about the uh, policy maker's case for uh, reasonable rates of return and also for building out the grid. I've got uh, four major topics I'm going to look at, which is uh, just first and foremost, from a policy perspective, the investment case for transmission. Though I imagine you probably heard quite a lot of that already today. Um, I do want to talk about the great historical cycles in transmission investment because that's really what you need to understand what is happening today at the state and regional level, which in fact is still where most of the important things are happening. I'll talk about the past policy agenda, which is going forward from the uh, great uh, Northeastern blackout of 2003 and the Energy Policy Act of 2005. And then finally, the future policy agenda. What is going on at FERC and what is going on uh, on Capitol Hill with regard to uh, transmission policy in the near term? And again, this is sort of geared toward a congressional staff type of audience, so those of you who are financial wizards we will just have to be satisfied that you heard Christy today. 
Um, look, the investment case for transmission, it's pretty simple and it's pretty obvious, and I think Christy nailed it on the head. Um, transmission is an extremely attractive investment. It's a great asset. We have a world that is aging demographically. We have huge retirement populations, and we also have a very yield-hungry uh, world. So the idea of a fixed investment that produces steady cash flow over time is extremely attractive. There is lots and lots of capital available for these uh, investments. Um, we've talked a lot at this conference about uh, renewables. I see Rob back in the, the back of the room making sure I bring up wind power or reliability. Those are all very important drivers and things that justify um, electric transmission. Back in the days, those long ago days, when we cared much more about power prices, I think a really key argument for transmission investment from a policymaker's standpoint was that uh, transmission gives you a tremendous amount of bang for the buck from a ratepayer's perspective. Relatively small investments in transmission can do a lot to lower power prices and certainly increase reliability and support economic development. We've seen it again and again in areas like Wisconsin and Michigan and other areas where they found that uh, beefing up the transmission infrastructure also supported the industrial employment in those areas. So all of these things are very significant reasons why policymakers uh, should want to support adequate, if not outright robust, levels of uh, transmission investment. Another one tends to get passed over, which is that transmission increasingly is a high-tech investment. Uh, there is a stereotype that transmission means uh, a wire in the ground, a wire between two large pylons. Um, my personal favorite place is not actually the um, the electric power uh, pylons of Europe. I just love driving through the Houston Ship Channel at night when they've lit all the towers up. You know, that is truly one of the most beautiful sights in America. But uh, with regard to um, transmission technology, whether you think mostly about investment in the distribution level of the grid, whether you think about grid 2.0, another fashionable buzzword, uh, we're incorporating a lot more intelligence into the grid, a lot more uh, provision for cybersecurity. We're supporting, uh, you know, microgrids. We're supporting many, many diverse sources. So the bottom line is policymakers really should understand that uh, the United States does need to proceed and develop much more of a high-tech grid uh, with uh, everything from digital switching uh, technologies to advanced uh, composite materials, advanced conductors, and so forth. It's you know, very important strategically. And uh, countries such as China, such as other Asian countries that don't have the benefit of 100 years of electric history the way we have, have really been barreling forward, uh, getting the benefits of a um, higher-tech grid. Finally, from a policymaker's perspective, you need to think about transmission as a risky investment. And um, certainly risky for all of the reasons of technology change and fickle consumer preferences that Christie mentioned, but frankly, it's risky for another big reason. And this is something that policymakers need to understand. Uh, there is a mentality in utilities world, there is a mentality perhaps even at FERC today, there's a mentality in a lot of places that wires between two poles, that's not high tech, that's not so risky, that's an asset which will last 100 years. And I think that's a really wrong attitude because a lot of the investment risk in transmission is risk up front. If you have a project that's going to take you 10 or even 20 years to get approved, and you've got to tie capital up while you're waiting for this project, and you have to deal with large amounts of uncertainty while waiting for the foreign service to give you a permit that you thought you'd get in two or three years and in fact has taken 10, um, you do need those higher ROEs to justify moving into a space where uh, you're going to wait a long time. You'll have to tie up capital and um, you know, you'll have any number of last minute surprises. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to break into this area. So I think ROE policy definitely does need to represent that level of risk as well. So if you look at transmission right now, uh, clearly trendy for many reasons. Uh, utilities have uh, been talking in recent years, not so much now, about investing in uh, marquee uh, transmission projects, big long distance high voltage projects, as a way of boosting uh, their earnings per share in an environment where power markets are flat, if not actually declining. You know, all of that is fine, um, but uh, 
the major headwinds for transmission investment, I would say, right now are simply that uh, declining demand, demand that is flat to declining for good reasons, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's demand response, uh, whether it is simply moving to more efficient lighting. You know, all of these things help, but um, the uh, declining demand, the um, the low power prices, historically low power prices because of the shale revolution and um, other factors are really discouraging major private equity investors and other institutional investors from moving into the transmission space. They just don't know what's going to get done. Uh, the sorts of projects that are getting done now tend to be the smaller projects, the more regional pros projects, and things that essentially are uh, building out a regional grid or linking a regional grid, uh, dealing with reliability issues, dealing with seams issues, and so forth. And that gets to me to my point about uh, the uh, the uh, you know massive national backbone power grid that was a slogan and a buzzword really from the 2003 power crisis. You know the Bush administration did a lot of this. They did a report called Grid 2030. Uh, President Obama's stimulus bill in 2009 was again supposed to support a lot of grid spending. And, um, you know, it's very interesting to wonder where is this national supergrid right now? You know, we talked about it for 15 years after 2003, and you do here and there see references to grid 2.0, you hear, see other grid discussions, but it's almost as if this has dropped off. Uh, the face of the earth. And a lot of it is just because, uh, number one, trends fade over time. But number two, uh, the U.S. power grid is not something that was designed from the top down in the first place. It's um, really been a bottom-up process. The U.S. power grid is, uh, you know, something that historically originated as a patchwork quilt, uh, different regions, different business models. And it originally wasn't really designed to operate as if it were going to be a set of national superhighways for power. It was a set of very regional markets. And what we're doing in a bottom-up process is gradually making that more and more robust, more and more regional. And it's actually a pretty good network. But, um, you know, it's simply not that kind of uh, Eisenhower-style national highway for power that some people uh, think about. Uh, if you think about the history of transmission development in the U.S., Clearly, the early days, the Pearl Street Station, the initial forays into electric power, did not involve a lot of transmission building. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually actively discouraged uh, utilities from serving more than a limited local area. He discouraged interstate transmission building, except for a couple of his pet mega projects. Um, Immediately after World War II, uh, President Truman asked Congress to update the uh, Natural Gas Act, and he gave FERC the authority to do eminent domain for uh, natural gas pipelines, which was great. But they didn't think about electricity at the time. Uh, the really great and golden age of transmission development was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when you began building out the grid, again to serve regional markets, but also to serve very large baseload power plants, whether they were nukes or mega coal plants. And that was a trend that continued into the early 70s. You could argue it resulted in, well, I mean, Jim Hecker would tell us there's never excess capacity in transmission, but we certainly had a huge build out uh, in that era that served us quite well until this second and more recent round of building uh, began uh, from 2003 onward. And as I said, at least according to EEI's projections, we're still in this second phase of build-out. Um, 1990s here in Capitol Hill were all about uh, electricity uh, restructuring, about um, unbundling, about merchant power companies. Remember those? Those were a really big deal in the early 2000s and uh, really only uh, left the stage very slowly. And uh, now, of course, we've got the present era where we are looking at, um, um, you know, many challenges, really challenges that, uh, that um, again, make investors pause before moving in. I won't go into the challenged economics of baseload power, but the reality is that the FERC-regulated wholesale markets are looking at a very dubious future right now. There's a lot of uncertainty there. So again, you know, a strong layer of policy support and attention to this from policymakers is, is going to be key. 
Um, moving on quickly, uh, just mentioned the 2005 Energy Policy Act. That was in many ways a uh, capitulation after the, the electricity wars of the mid-1990s to the early 2000s. Uh, they did have a federal backstop siting there to get transmission lines built. They had incentive rates, uh, again, to give uh, financial incentives for companies to incorporate this great high-tech stuff into the grid and to uh, build transmission lines in high-priority areas, whether it was high-priority for renewables or high-priority for other purposes. And uh, finally, FERC was made the uh, ultimate regulator of reliability, you know, a single agency that had responsibility for the whole wholesale power market and was there to basically police these reliable reliability issues and make sure we had far fewer of the blackout incidents, which uh, I think we have. I mean, we've certainly had a lot of weather-related blackouts we've had to get through the, um, the uh, polar vortex. But on the whole, you know, reliability has improved since 2005. Um, switching the attention to FERC, uh, FERC implemented uh, the 2005 energy bill. They discovered, though, that those uh, wonderful adders for transmission were hard to square with just and reasonable rates in a, a low interest rate world and gradually backed off them. Uh, FERC also, um, you know, looked at Order 1000 as a way to expedite the siting process and, you know, perhaps encourage the financing of transmission projects uh, that way. Um, coming up, the new agenda at FERC, uh, clearly we need to come up with a more rational way of doing ROEs, a more predictable way. Uh, Christie said the process was complicated. It's not really that complicated. What you do is you take fortune cookie slips, uh, and uh, these are called a proxy group, and you, you know, write down everyone's ROE on a fortune cookie slip, drop it in a hat, and you uh, pick uh, a number out of the hat until you get a politically acceptable result. And, you know, what could be more predictable and reliable than that? Uh, so we'd like to see FERC work on a more predictable ROE policy. The D.C. Circuit has given them an, exam an opportunity to do that. Uh, we'll be looking at what FERC does on baseload power markets. Uh, we'll be looking at FERC on Order uh, 2000 as well. Uh, 2000 was a great idea, but it was kind of a complex idea too, and some key terms uh, I think need better definition. What is a cost? What is a benefit? What is a regional market? I think that this coming FERC is probably going to be more results oriented. They want to cut to the chase rather than planning about planning, and I'd like to see them uh, take a strong look at Order uh, 1000. The congressional agenda really depends on the infrastructure bill. Will there be an infrastructure bill? Um, the uh, best things they could do is possibly revisit some of the backstop siting. We talked about that uh, a little earlier. There are many proposals out there. I'm skeptical that Congress is really going to walk right back to the line of federal eminent domain, but they're looking for ways of uh, applying some body uh, language to the process, uh, maybe perhaps uh, giving um, you know, FERC uh, citing authority for or, uh, allowing eminent federal backstop authority for projects which have gotten uh, approval through a uh, Order 1000 deciding process. Uh, maybe they're not even going to go something, maybe they're not even going to do something electricity specific at all and simply try to make the permitting process uh, more predictable by putting a shot clock on different agencies or having some form of accountability. Uh, for agencies like the Interior Department or the Agriculture Department so the Forest Service can't just run out the clock forever with utter impunity the way they do now. Uh, so that's sort of where we are and where the congressional agenda uh, may be. Tax policy will be important. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, investors were very worried about elimination of the interest expense deduction and, uh, in effect, a mandatory expensing of capital uh, investments not a good thing in a rate-regulated uh, uh, industry. I think I told you back in January that I thought there would be a carve-out for the electric power industry, and I think that's still very likely to be the case. Overall, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a haircut reduction of the interest expense, of the interest expense deduction for most industries. But uh, I generally think that uh, regulated electric power is going to be fine at the end of the day. And uh, that, I think, is... Uh, I'm going to go over my notes and see if I missed anything. But yeah, those are really the major points. So I think that um, you know there are booms and busts. There are big swings back and forth. And um, if the last energy bill was all about dealing with the, uh, the um, 
great blackout of August 3rd, 2003. Uh, the next round of energy legislation is going to be uh, dealing with, uh, um, you know, supporting development of a grid in this environment where demand growth is flat to declining and there's a lot of uncertainty about how power markets will work in the future. So thank you very much. As soon as Todd is done with his excellent presentation, we'll go directly to the next panel because we're running long. So. It, by all means, feel free to grab coffee. I'm a coffee fiend and I know that this kind of post-lunch lull needs a little bit of a leg stretch. So please uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to stretch your legs or get coffee as needed. It's, thank you, Jim, for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. I mean, so many uh, luminaries in the building, and, um, and uh, I feel a little uh, out of my league. But I'll tr do my best to uh, meet Jim's criteria of not droning on and actually try to answer the question of the panel, which is uh, why invest now, right? We've heard a lot of questions about or a lot of statements about why it's difficult to invest now, right? Let's actually try to think about what we can do to actually invest today. And just to revisit some of the great points that previous panelists have made, there's a huge amount of uncertainty that is really causing transmission to not get built, even if you have capital available, right? How much renewables is going to come on the system? Where are they going to be located? How is that going to affect our transmission flows? Right? Where is your central, central generation going to be? Where is your load going to grow? Is it going to grow? Is it going to grow net of things behind the meter? Right? So if you don't understand where your central, central generation is going to be, and you don't understand where your load is going to be, how are you supposed to make a 40-year fixed investment in infrastructure? It's nearly impossible. I don't envy my utility colleagues who are sitting there plugging away doing power flows and having no idea where to build their transmission. Right? Can, even if you knew where you had perfect, you could put your hand on a big glowing orb and see the future uh, um, and know where you need to build your line, can you actually get it built? Right? These are real challenges that are impeding investment today. And what you're going to see is that on top of it, growing demand that we always have the lights on, right? that we always can be able to, to plug in our gadgets. And so you know, it's, it puts a, the industry in near paralysis, and I think this is what we're seeing. And I think what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my smart wire specific hat off, and I'm going to represent or try my best to, to represent a larger coalition of advanced transmission technologies that really can help unlock this paralysis and create near risk-free investment in our grid, right? The ability to make risk-free, great bet investments in our grid today, despite all this great uncertainty. So it's actually a whole host of technologies, right? These, these technologies include advanced power flow control, which Smart Wires provides, and I'll get to what that means, dynamic line rating or advanced conductors, advanced EMS, data analytics, energy efficiency, demand response, energy storage. All of these things can be no regrets investments in this uncertain world. A lot of these technologies use existing right-of-ways, so you get rid of a lot of the siting uncertainty, a lot of these technologies are modular, so you can scale your investment to precise needs and not have to predict 20, 10, 20, 30 years in the future. You can make investments that make sense today for the short term. A lot of these technologies are redeployable, re right? So if you have a short term need or you have only a little bit of uncertainty about a need today, you use it in that location today and you move it somewhere else, right? So a lot of these technologies depending on the actual application, these technologies can be no regrets investment. So that's the one thing I want you guys to understand today is that advanced transmission technologies can allow you to invest in transmission today. So how do smart wires do it? Smart wires is advanced power flow control, which unless you uh, have done power flow analysis, you're not going to understand. But it does one elegant thing, and hopefully this is, this is something your grandma can understand. It pushes and pulls power around problems on the transmission grid. That's it. One elegant function, many, many applications. And what you see here in this top row is a typical planning study. You got load on one side, you have generation on the other side, you have multiple paths that connect uh, the two on the transmission grid. 
and you have an overload. This overload may be five, 10 years out. We don't quite know. It may show up in two years. It may be 5%. It may be 20%, right? All this uncertainty in, that I spoke of previously is, is driving at what that number is and whether that's 99 or 101. Um, and so what do you do in this case? Well, in the short term, you may dispatch generation different, differently to get around it operationally, but in the long term, you're gonna need to reconductor, rebuild, or build a new line, unless you use advanced technologies to, to invest. Our guardian, power, uh, guardian technology basically goes on the constrained line and pushes power to underutilized capacity. Wait a sec, Jim, you said there's no extra capacity on the grid, right? Jim, is there extra capacity on the grid? There is. There's, un there's extra capacity on the grid. It just currently can't be accessed because of security constraints, and I won't bore you with what those are. But they, if you can help direct power, you can soften those constraints and unlock unused capacity in our grid today. Our second technology is called the router because it both pushes and pulls. So you can put it on the constrained line and push power away, or you can put it on the underutilized line and pull power towards it. Just additional level of flexibility. A uh, little bit more detail in terms of products, and I can't stand animation. Uh, <laughs> apologies for this. But you have our first technology, the Power Guardian. This actually clamps to conductors. We have this deployed at PG&E, uh, Georgia Power, AirGrid, the Irish National Grid Operator, um, Australia, RTE, a whole list of customers. Um, I think over uh, four or five years of, of actual field deployments ready to go, uh, being commercialized today. Uh, you have our Power Guardian technology that is scheduled to be deployed next year for the first time commercially. Um, and you have the Power Router, which should be 2019 first time commercial deployment. Um, again, pushing and pulling. Um, and the key word here is you're gonna hear is flexibility. Flexibility in terms of how we invest, flexibility in terms of how we deploy, flexibility in terms of your ability to uh, control power in real time. Um, so if you want to just deploy a few units, you can hang them from the conductor. You can put them in a compact deployment between two spans. Uh, if you need a bit more oomph, you can hang them from dedicated towers. You really need a lot more oomph, you can put them in state substations. Um, and Flexibility in terms of deployment, right? So whatever your, our customers need. If you want to, if your substation space is really limited, you put them on towers. If you have plenty of substation space, throw them in the substation, whatever you need. Um, so again, one elegant function has many, one elegant function of pushing or pulling power around problems can have many, many applications, right? So uh, just trying to build a bit better grid, the ability to have more control in real-time operations. The ability to uh, optimize your spend based on what problems you have, where, you, where you're allowed to deploy capital, where you maybe want to try to game the system a little bit, to spend in high ROE areas and save in other areas. Maybe you have uh, particular customers that are particularly difficult um, in our PG&E uh, um, installation. There was uh, vineyards that were particularly difficult with land use rights, and by putting our devices on the towers, they, no boots ever touched the ground of those vineyards. We deployed them all via helicopter. All the linemen came in through helicopter. All the devices got hung through helicopter. Not a single boot on the ground. So that's really solving a very specific locational problem, right? Um, again, I, sorry, I hate up. <laughs> uh, capital optimization. Um, not all utilities can put their rates to the sky, right? So uh, when one particular utility we're working with, they gave us a portfolio of $500 million worth of capital improvements they wanted to make. They needed to save capital. We were able to save $200 million out of that uh, $500 million ca uh, capital um, set. And uh, we're going to proceed with quite a few of those projects and working with them now to get approval on those projects. Um, rapid solutions. Our devices can be deployed within a year, period full stop, right? Many times with very little to no permitting requirements because we're going into existing substation space or existing towers or existing, existing conductors, right? All that uncertainty about whether you can actually get iron in the ground and get a project done, eliminated. And better integration of renewables. Uh, we have a study on our website you can look to 
where we looked at the PGM uh, PRISM study or PRS study, uh, PGM Renewable Integration, I believe it's the acronym, um, and essentially to hit 30% renewables, it would, would have cost PJM about $4 billion in transmission investments. We were able to reduce that to $2.2 million in, or billion in, in investment, upfront capital, so roughly $1.8 in upfront uh, billion in upfront capital uh, savings, an additional $800 to $900 million in reduction in load costs per year, which is roughly $10 billion uh, net present value. So, I mean, just huge amounts of savings through the ability to tune your investment to the specific need, right? Why invest in, an, in a gigawatt with a transfer capability when you only need 750, right? Or maybe you only need 100, or maybe you only need 10, right? So being able to fine tune your investments and provide more operational control, real-time control of electrons uh, provides just huge benefits. So, um, again, the one thing I want you guys walking away with today is that you can invest in transmission today using advanced technologies. So um, to, to, to try to put a second point in your head is that this idea of short-term and near-term problems is something that the grid hasn't really seen or have been able to deal with recently, right? With the, all the uncertainty we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of short-term projects, projects that have a finite duration, two years, three years, four years in duration. No longer are they 20 years, right? They're, the need is falling off because of declining load, or maybe it's a uh, delay in, in build. Maybe uh, it's a generation uh, coming offline and then new generation being going back online later on because of a repower. Those short-term problems traditionally are just dealt with through operational problems plan to shed load or, or try to redispatch generation. But you can actually solve those problems with advanced transmission technologies because they're redeployable. And it's not going to be a stranded 40-year investment of permanent iron in the ground. Right? Near-term problems, problems that weren't expected. Your permitting, instead of taking two years, took 10 years, and your project isn't coming in on time. You thought you were covered. You're no longer covered, but you no longer have the ability to invest today. Right? Because Traditional transmission investment does take 5, 10, 15 years to develop. So advanced transmission technologies can be rapidly deployed and solve those near-term problems, right? Um, you know, i just going to keep it short, keep it sweet, and just say, again, we are, uh, SmartWire specifically is not your typical startup. We're not just eight guys in a garage with laptops. Uh, we are a, uh, a basically a utility formed startup. All of the requirements, all the products developed by our utility partners for utilities. Right? We are gaining great momentum around the globe, as well as in the United States, and uh, and I think what we're going to see is that we are able to invest in the transmission grid today. So with that, I really appreciate being here and look forward to your questions. I think you're going to have to deliver your questions in person as these fine folks leave. They did a great job. I think this is a very, very exciting panel, and uh, I thank them for being here. Unfortunately.